We're gonna do a quick tour of space camp so you guys can see a little bit about what we do. They are going to be your tour guides slash simulator operators um, for the next little bit. This is one of our latest additions to our, uh, our outdoor exhibition. If you take a look up at the back of the orbiter, you see the area where the, the three main engines fit into the back of the ship. That's uh, this part right here. If the compressor ever broke, it would actually the weight of it would make it collapse in on itself. Because normally, uh, for things like engines and, and some satellites, all the fuel and such is pressure. kept on the inside. Right. So the like uh, like when you buy a soda can, right. all the pressure is still on the inside and you can't squeeze it. So that's kept pressurized for display. Yes. Dude. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. This oddly shaped building here is Habitat One, where we're heading. When it was designed, it was modeled uh, uh, to look sort of like uh, a space station because you have this round shape to the walls, it maximizes the amount of usable space on the inside. We are all about inspiring people. Did you hear that? <laughs> this is Habitat One. When uh, most of our trainees arrive, this is the first place they come. This is where, they, uh, th where they'll meet their crew trainers, they'll meet their bunk mates. This is where they'll find out what team they're on and meet the, the, their trainees, the people who will be on their train, on their team for the next week. Uh, it's essentially, we have three floors to the building. Second floor is usually guys. Fourth floor is girls, and third floor changes around depending on the uh, the workload we had for that day, that week. Uh, sometimes we have a gift shop down in this area. The uh, cabins are actually the same size as the mid deck on the space shuttle where you have five to seven astronauts where they do their, their work, their sleep, their, their eating, and their living. At Habitat 2 next door, the bays are larger. They'll hold 50 to 100. Usually uh, larger school groups or church groups will come and use those and they'll just get the whole bay for that. We have uh, security guards who work here. They're here 24 hours a day and they keep a night watch at night. We have counselors on duty, on call for the week who are, they'll have big signs on their door if someone needs to go to them for an emergency in the middle of the night. And we have uh, nurses here 24 7 as well. It's nerd fauna, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> Now, Marshall is in charge of conducting all of the experiments that go on in space. It's kind of the science mission control. Um, I know they work on some of the engines here in Huntsville. They don't build them here, but I, I know they calibrate them here and they do research on them here. Okay. This is where the teams will come and do their simulated missions. Over here, the one you can see is modeled after the new uh, Orion capsule. And so we're working not only, you know, still with doing shuttle simulations, even though we've retired the shuttles, we're moving on. We still we have simulations too that are also looking ahead to the uh, the future of spaceflight. This is our Hall of Fame Wall of Fame. Uh, actually, if you look here at 2012, uh, Commander Hugh Gibson. I believe you guys are going to meet him later today. So he is one of our most recent Hall of Famers. Dottie Metcalf Lindberger was our space, first space uh, camp graduate to join the astronaut program and go into space. One of the most recent events we did here was an overnight museum where we invited a, whole, uh, a bunch of people that could come and we spent the night under the Saturn V and we used our 3D theater, hooked it up to NASA TV, and we watched the, uh, the landing of the Martian lander Curiosity in the new laboratory up there. And this, this, uh, this model is to scale. Curiosity is that big. It's about the size of an SUV.
But this is where the, the trainees will do their actual simulated shuttle missions. The uh, payload specialists will normally be the ones down here. Uh, the mission specialist, pilot commander will be up top of the flight deck, of course, conducting the mission with these guys. We're pretty much alone for the ride at first, but then they do all the fun experiments and such when, uh, when they get into space. All of them are speaking to mission control over the headsets. Now the amount of communication they get really depends on the age group of the kids. When they start out, 5th, 6th grade, everyone can hear everyone and they're reading lines like from a play, like from a script. And uh, as they get older, we give them really just uh, uh, guidebooks to tell them what switches to do at what time and we instruct them in how to communicate. You know, how to communicate. Say if you had to talk to mission control, you're activating solar evaporators or something, you would say, you know. Houston, this is payload specialist one. I'm deploying such and such solar array, and then you get your switches at the right time. Cool. That kind of thing. And all the while, they can encounter anomalies and problems which come at them from a random list at a random time. And we grade them on how they conduct themselves professionally, especially during those crisis times, and, and how well they solve the problems. Depending on the duration of the mission and what you're taking with you, it may not be just this capsule. If you're going to the moon, possibly if it's some of the longer deep space, deep space missions, what you'll do is you'll rendezvous with your equipment separately from the, from the manned launch into space, and that equipment will have its own, essentially, habitat module that you'll live in as well. So you'll have a lot of space to stretch out and assemble whatever they're taking in orbit. Exactly.